Okay. Uh, it's 1030. So uh, I'm going to call this meeting of the New York State Cemetery Board uh, to order. Uh, I'm Mark Patterson and I am uh, sitting as chair for Secretary of State Rosano Rosado. Let me just remind people of a few of our uh, rules or new procedures. Uh, this meeting is being held remotely according to executive order, which our council will explain in a moment. Um, uh, please mute your line when you're not speaking. Uh, that makes everything a lot easier. Uh, cuts down the background noise. Uh, when you are speaking, please identify yourself each time you're speaking. Uh, we need to, we, we are recording this meeting and we need to keep an accurate uh, record. So that's uh, helpful. Um, uh, we'll uh, go through our regular agenda as has been uh, posted. Uh, if we have an executive session, I don't think we will today, but if we do, we will uh, go into executive session without adjourning the meeting, and then we will come out of executive session, report on any actions or taken or not taken, and then vote uh, to adjourn uh, the meeting. We will have a public participation uh, opportunity for anyone who wants to speak to the board. Uh, and uh, if you are gonna get Tony to explain the rules, we appreciate if you uh, identify yourself, uh, but you're required to do it under certain circumstances. I think that's all I have. Uh, let me just also, though, I think I forgot to do this last uh, special meeting to make sure I introduce my colleagues on the board. Uh, uh, Jill, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm Jill Faber, and I'm a representative of Attorney General Letitia James. Great. Thanks. And Tom? Uh, yeah, this is Thomas Fuller uh, representing Dr. Howard Zucker for the Department of Health. Great. And we have a, a staff, uh, our director, our assistant director, and other staff available in our council. Tony, do you want to talk about uh, the rules and what, under which we're operating? Sure. So we are operating pursuant to Governor's Executive Order 202.1, which has been extended. Uh, pursuant to that order, uh, Article 7 of the Public Officers Law is modified to permit any public body to meet and take action without permitting in public in-person access to meetings and to authorize such meetings to be held remotely by conference call or similar service provide that the public has the ability to view or listen to such proceeding and that such meetings are recorded and later transcribed. Uh, this executive order has been interpreted to suspend the requirement that board members be physically convened or convened by video conference, to suspend the requirement that notice of the meeting include the physical location of each board member. If given the public notice of the meeting and how to attend by video conference or by telephone conference, and the board agenda and board material have been placed on the Division of Cemeteries website, one final note, we are taking attendance. Giving your name and who you represent is voluntary unless you are a lobbyist, then you must identify yourself and your client. And we ask that anyone who does speak to the board identify themselves. That's it. Thank you, Tony. Uh, again, we've uh, posted our agenda. Um, we'll uh, go back in a moment to our council for a report on any legislation or rules and regulations. Uh, Louis Polshock will give the division a report and then we will go through uh, uh, vandalism uh, report and vandalism applications and then other applications to the board. So that will be our agenda. Uh, Tony, do you want to up update us on uh, pending legislation or current legislation? Sure. There has been some activity since we last, well, since I last reported, not since we last met, I last reported a month ago, but we've met since then. Um, the first item is uh, number five on the list, Assembly 382. It's a one house bill that would uh, include in the definition of uh, cemetery corporations to dispose remains by natural organic reduction, natural, natural organic reduction facility. Um, this bill has uh, advanced to third reading. Um, we'll see if it actually makes it through the assembly and to the Senate. Uh, the next bill that has moved, this bill was actually uh, signed into law. Uh, this is the number nine on the list, Senate 866. Oh, I, I mentioned the bill number, one of the bill numbers at least. I think I did. Number five was a Assembly 382. That's the organic reduction bill. Uh, the bill I'm speaking of now, it nine on the list, Senate 866. Uh, this uh, 
relates to establishing a veteran cemetery, uh, modifies the, requ the requirements for that. Uh, it was, uh, it made it through both houses and was signed on uh, February 16th. Next item on the list. So we have some new activity. Um, this is down near the end, number 16 on the list. Assembly 5098 was introduced and referred to corporations on February 11. Uh, this bill would modify the general business law to permit pet cemeteries to bury pet owner cremated remains for a fee, as long as certain disclosures are made. Our, rec our regulations only permit them to bury uh, human cremated remains if they don't charge a fee. So that would alter our regulations or supersede our regulations. Um, number 17 on the list, Assembly 5671. This is an old bill that that's popped up again. Um, this would permit municipalities to impose certain charges on certain tax exempt property, including cemeteries. Uh, they would be for police protection, fire protection, street and highway, things like that. Um, number 18 on the list. Uh, I think this is a new bill. I don't remember seeing this before. This also uh, relates to, or maybe we did see this before. This relates to veteran cemeteries as well. It, it provides a uh, funding mechanism, uh, a way to promote people to donate and contribute funds towards a veteran's cemetery. That's Senate 4735. Lastly, uh, this is a bill I missed in the assembly. It was introduced, no, I missed in the Senate. Uh, this is uh, Senate Bill 1517. Uh, this would require a death certificate for any fetal death, regardless of gestational age, and would permit the mother to make burial and tomb and cremation arrangements for the remains, again, regardless of gestational age. Uh, that was introduced in the assembly on January 12th, introduced in the Senate on February 26th. And uh, that's all I have. All right, Tony. Uh, anybody have any questions for Tony in his legislative report? Yeah, actually, I do, Tony. Um, natural organic reduction. Are they talking about alkaline hydrolysis or something else? Or yeah, I believe that's defined? the intent. Um, hold on, let me scroll up to that. That's the pollen bill. Because um, I was paging through it and I didn't yes. see a definition. The term natural organic reduction facility well, where uh, is a building where natural organic reduction occurs. Natural organic right. reduction right. means uh, the contained accelerated conversion of human remains to soil. Um, so is this tree pods then? Yeah. It's the human, yeah, mulch, the human mulch bill. <laughs> okay. Who said that? Rich, Rich Moylan. Okay. That's Katrina Spade in Washington. That's what that is. All right. Okay. So there you go. Yeah, as an aside, I've seen articles about uh, using mushrooms to convert bodies into organic material. They, they actually have a mushroom shroud. Uh, so there's all kinds of creative ways out there and uh, alternatives to, um, the chemical process we now use. So it's, it's composting, really, is that, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's what this is, yeah. There was a bill that, what Lewis is mentioning, there, there was a bill that would have included alkaline hydrolysis in the definition of, of cremation. This is not that bill. This is, right, composting. Oh, composting, okay. sorry. And any other reports from you, Tony, in terms of rules or regulations? No, um, still, processing through the Department of State. Uh, so we're not there yet to bring it back to the board. Okay. Uh, I neglected to note that uh, we usually approve the minutes. We just didn't get the minutes uh, uh, reviewed by everyone in time for the meeting. So we'll uh, bring them back to the next board meeting for uh, their approval. Um, uh, okay, uh, so no other questions for Tony. Uh, can we have the division report from Lewis? 
That would require me to, that would require me to unmute, right? Yeah. It didn't work so well without it. Um, so first, everybody's favorite topic: cremation statistics. Um, cremations are still above average uh, for 29 kids compared to 2019, but are down. Um, we hit a high in this latest. Uh, I don't want to say second wave because it's. I think technically, the way I understand it, it's not a second wave until you've had a mutation. Um, and the first, the increases in cases were fueled by just more people getting the same thing. But the second go round of increased cases of COVID, um, um, we hit a high of 75% above the 2019 average in the, in the first week in January. It's now come down to 38% above average. We're not seeing any delays to speak of anywhere outside of New York City, and even New York City, uh, the crematories are operating at only just a little over, a, are booking out on average just a little over two days. I wouldn't regard anything within two days as really being a delay because people don't always book cremations. There's no right or even expectation to be able to necessarily bring in a cremation the same day. Um, so that's that's good news in the aggregate. Obviously, not good news for people who've lost family members, but on the, in the aggregate, aggregate, that's good news. Uh, by the way, that's last week's statistics. We don't get this week's until today. Um, second thing, our annual report is due March 31st. If you are on a calendar year, if your fiscal and calendar year are coextensive, so please get that in. Please try to use. Um, our online portal, it now, allow, again, allows you to save your work as you go, which will make it much easier to use. Uh, number three thing, um, specifically about the legislation Tony was talking about, um, we got a call yesterday about human composting. And uh, to be clear, there, if all you're talking about is burying a body in some creative way, and you're not going to be removing that body from the ground to do anything else, that's just a burial. You can do that. Although you might want to think about if you're promising things like trees and such. Again, I'm not sure whether these tree pod things require moving from one place to another. If they do, we would regard that as a disinterment. If you're just burying someone in the ground, whether they're in a uh, traditional casket or something lined with mushrooms, um, it really, it's just a burial. But uh, if you're making promises about what's going to come of that burial, I think it behooves people to think about things. Like, for example, if trees are involved, what's going to happen to that tree? Um, what happens if the tree dies? What happens if the, uh, what happens if you have to trim the tree? You know, I could imagine people saying, when the tree has to be trimmed, you're cutting grandma. So um, these are things if you're going to be promote a burial is just a burial, even if it's in a different kind of container, but you do have to think about, think these things through. Um, so you don't end up over promising you're getting yourself in trouble. Um, if you are moving a body from one place in the ground to another place in the ground, as far as we're concerned, that's a disinterment. And the rules on disinterment would apply. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is we're getting a lot of calls about grave buybacks, both from individuals and from cemeteries. I just want to review this should be pretty familiar, but I just want to review this. Um, first of all, I think everyone here knows you can't just if you own a grave, you can't just sell it to whoever you want on the open market. You have to offer it back to the cemetery at a statutory price first. And if the statutory price is the original price paid plus 4% simple, i.e. not compounded interest if for each year since the purchase, then that's if the grave is, is, um, is vacant. Um, though nobody's buried in the plot, even if it's a multi-grave plot. The way this works in practice is that people typically negotiate with the cemetery before making that formal offer to know whether the cemetery is willing to offer them more, willing to offer them that much, um, but uh, and uh, you really ought to call and do that too. But unless you get a written refusal from the cemetery to pay at least that statutory price, you can't sell that grave to anyone else. 
if the cemetery refuses to pay at least that statutory price to reacquire the grave, then you got a year to sell it however you want to whomever you want with the exception of you cannot use a broker, you cannot sell it via or to a funeral director, and um, there's a third exception that I'm forgetting. No brokers, no funeral directors. Those are the big two that you can't do. Um, so again, just, just a reminder, because we're getting a lot of calls about this. Also, one other reminder to cemeteries, you do not have to repurchase graves if you do not want them. If you don't pay, offer at least a statutory price, people can try to sell them to whoever they want, but that there's no obligation for you to reacquire graves. Conversely, there's no prohibition on paying more than the statutory price if the person is unwilling to sell it for just that price and you can actually make money by paying more than what the statute would require, but less than your market price. So that, that especially comes up downstate at cemeteries where particular cemeteries or particular sections are becoming full. So those are all just things to keep in mind. Again, we're getting a lot of calls about this. Um, and uh, there seems to be a fair amount of uh, a misunderstanding. If you've got more specific situations, call us. I can't give general guidance beyond that. And that is all I have. Uh, Lewis, uh, we have guidance posted on our website on that? The short answer is I think so. I'd have to double check. Okay, and uh, I didn't actually prep you for this, but uh, at the last meeting, we had a fairly extensive conversation about the Ulster County Veterans Cemetery, and uh, that's not on our agenda. What's the status of that? Um, my understanding, to, I'll defer to Tony on this, my understanding is we're waiting for them to clarify exactly what the outline of their, their transaction is gonna be. Okay. I, I can let you know, um, Mr. Doyle from the county, uh, he and I got into a, a very brief game of phone tag. We haven't been able to speak. So he has reached out to me, but uh, we haven't had a conversation yet. Um, hopefully it's, Hopefully, it's a call to say they've got it all resolved or any issues are minor, but uh, I'll, I'll let the board know. Yeah, I just I mean, remember the time deadlines that we were concerned about. Or they yeah. were uh, one other deadline to remind you, remind you guys of and us in particular is that we owe you something on uh, Southern Tiers compliance. Uh, we don't have that ready for this meeting. We plan to have that ready for the next meeting. Um, I also want to try, I, this wasn't on the agenda, I just want to add it because I saw it in the paper yesterday. Um, in June or July, I forget which, of 2019, the board approved a renovation project um, at uh, Woodlawn Cemetery in Canandaigua uh, for their chapel. Um, and it got a, the chapel project got a really nice write-up in the Rochester Democrat and Con Chronicle, um, um, I believe, on Monday. So uh, our... our the work that the board does does sometimes, I mean, they didn't reference us, but this project got a fair, a nice bit of press. Okay. I muted my stream, sorry about that. Sorry, does any board members have any questions for uh, the division and the division report? Okay. I, have one. Go ahead. I just have one additional comment on um, that bill, the composting bill. Um, it's been a while since I, I looked at this, but you know, my memory is that the businesses that do this, they basically have a building and, and the, the remains go in with soil in a unit in that building. It's, it's kind of like a columbarium type setup. And so the composting occurs above ground. And once the body's fully composted, then the soil and all the everything that's in there gets put in the ground. So um, it's, I guess you could compare it to like an ossuary where, you know, remains are put in, like they do this in Southern Europe a lot, <clears throat> put in an ossuary until they've reached for, for a number of years and then they're finally put in the ground after that. Um, so that's, that's my recollection of what the process would be like. I'm gonna have to look up that word. Okay, anybody have questions for Tony or Lewis on their reports? Uh, Alicia, do you have the vandalism report? I do. Uh, the 2021 calendar year vandalism collections are $195,455. Uh, 
assessment collections are $108,879. Fiscal year collections from April 1st, 2020 are vandalism $270,150 and assessment $153,629. Of the $2 million 2020-21 vandalism fund appropriation, $171,925.24 was paid on outstanding vouchers for applications approved in the 2018-19 fiscal year. $550,551.31 was paid on outstanding vouchers for applications approved in the 2019-20 fiscal year. And $526,764.08 was paid in vouchers for applications approved in the current fiscal year. Uh, vouchers on previously approved applications totaling $193,320.11 have been processed by DOS Fiscal Office and are pending payment. There remains $138,912.96 of funds committed for prior year's applications and $189,020.80 committed for applications approved in the current fiscal year, leaving $239,615.46 available for future applications. We have a total of $258,525.48 going before the board today. Uh, there are two applications in the pipeline for approval, total $42,435. And we have six applications going before the board today. Thank you, Alicia. Does anybody have any questions of Alicia's vandalism report? Okay, so I'm gonna move to the vandalism applications. Uh, if, if there's no objection, I would take um, the, uh, three forest lawn applications as one, although I'll detail each of them, because uh, I think all the issues that were raised before are the same. Uh, one is for St. Matthew's Cemetery in Erie County in the amount of $53,292.50. Another is Lakeside Cemetery in Erie for the amount of $55,070.50. And the third is $66,335, uh, totaling the total of $174,698 in uh, hazardous monument fund applications. Uh, can someone from the division present those uh, and where there are differences or if there are any differences between the three? Mike, oh, this is Mike Seelman. Here, Mike, Mike Seelman from can... Division of Cemeteries. Okay. Are you going to do it, Lewis? Yeah. I keep muting myself as I move the keyboard. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, essentially, the um, board um, asked that these be tabled last month um, because of potential issues with. Um, with uh, uh, a related a potential related party transaction, and also to give the cemetery additional time, if it could, to solicit additional bids. So the cemeteries attempted to do that. Um, they got one additional bid that is way higher than both their own bid and the bid from uh, their employees' relatives' company, um, and uh, they also. They submitted information about that. They also clarified that of the three bids they had last time, one of the three bidders does, in fact, um, perform, do their own foundation work. Two of them don't. A little background fact. I don't know how relevant it is. Um, and uh, the president of the cemetery submitted a letter explaining that there, the time, if any, for consideration of uh, Revitalization Act issues would be when they actually contract to do the work, and they represented they will, in fact, comply with all the related party provisions when they do that. Um, the president does make clear that he's aware that the lowest bid is from a company um, whose, uh, the owners of whose relative is an employee of the cemetery. They're submitting their application based on this bid because it's the lowest bid and because they don't believe it's appropriate for them to ask the state for more money 
give be, simply because this guy's family owns the company that is submitted the lowest bid. Uh, they now have three bids, the cemetery's own bid, uh, this company's bid, and a third company's bid, and they're asking for the lower of all three for all three cemeteries, and we're recommending approval. Okay. Uh, Tony, do you have any issues uh, regarding these applications? Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad the cemetery was able to get another bid. Uh, it, it justifies the low bid. Uh, just to clarify what Lewis said, um, the uh, conflict of interest and related party provisions of the NPCL doesn't require a not-for-profit to take a higher bid. It requires it to do due diligence when it's going to be uh, potentially engaging with a related party. So um, I think for t today's vote, we're we're good with the fact that uh, they did get another bid from a, an unrelated party. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's anybody any questions for the or any additional information to be provided from either the cemetery or any questions from the board members? None from me. No, none here. Okay. So I'll make a motion um, to approve the, the three bids from Forest Lawn subject to appropriation. One uh, is an application to St. Matthews for 53000 $292.50, another from Lakeside Cemetery, $55,070.50, and the last one uh, in the amount of $66,335, uh, totaling uh, an application package of $174,698. Uh, all those were in the Erie County. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Tom. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those three motions uh, carry. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, an abandonment application. Uh, I guess this is a little bit of a wrinkle from the town of Akagashi uh, in St. Lawrence County and in the amount of $24,725.68. And Lewis, uh, someone presenting that to the board. Michael give the details. I just want to preface this by saying I was unable to get clear. This, it's unclear to me that this even needs board action, uh, but we had a similar situation come up with Whispering Maples, and I was unable before today to get clarification from our Bureau of Fiscal Management as to whether they would require an actual formal modification of the board order. Uh, Michael give the details, but essentially what happened here is a couple of items on this abandonment, which is a very large abandonment, kind of like Whispering Maples. It's the other mausoleum only cemetery in the state, and it's now in town of Oswegatchie's property or town of Oswegatchie's business. Um, has come in for a very large application. Most of the things that they did came in under budget, but one or two items are coming in over budget. And we had an issue at Whispering Maples where we couldn't pay the over budget things with the under budget amounts without the board clarifying that that was okay. So, hence we're back here. Mike, you want to give the details as to those things that came in under and those things that came in over and what the what the net the net is that we're saving about a little over a grant. But you, Mike, you want to give the details? Yes, this is Mike Seelman with Division of Cemeteries. Um, the town of Oswegatchie took over the Foxwood Mausoleum complex in 2015, and they came to the division for uh, uh, with an application for uh, several um, repairs to the grounds and equipment. Uh, the division approved 504, or the board approved 504,000. $610.74 for various um, items. The town has done the work uh, and they were able to come in $28,539.67 under budget on uh, the, the, the major um, repair was a roof. Uh, they submitted a bid for 243,000 and were able to get the work done for 221,000. So they were under budget on the, that. 
Uh, they had repairs to a culvert, um, office equipment, uh, lift for uh, the mausoleum, uh, and other equipment, as well as uh, sidewalk repair. They came in $28,539 under budget. On the other end, they had uh, a flooring issue where the actual cost was $27,368 higher. So we do have a difference and the request is for the, uh, the town to uh, reallocate some of the money that they have saved from the items that came in under budget and apply them towards the uh, flooring in the truck, which came in over budget. Uh, the end result is um, rather than the $504,610.71, the total is still under budget at $503,507.53. And we would just ask that uh, the town be able to be able to And the division recommends that this be done. Thank you, Michael. The 24,000 number is the amount of money that's being reallocated to different projects. That's correct. All right. Does anybody have any? Oh, Tony, do you have any issues with this? Uh, I don't mean issues. Are there, do you have any comments on this application? Uh, um, if there is going to be a motion, it, it should be to uh, modify the prior order uh, to reallocate funds. Uh, as set forth in Mike's memo, page two of the memo really lays out the uh, the reallocation, um, and that's the extent of my comments. Thank you, Tony. Um, does do any board members have any questions uh, on this application? Um, not not on this application. It's more um, um, on the the process with this type of application. So. Because the prior approval was for a particular amount rather than the individual amounts for each component, um, I, I'm just wondering, um, and maybe this speaks to what, what you were saying, Lewis, whether we need to approve a reallocation because the approval, the prior approval was for a particular amount. Is it is it because the application listed specific um specific costs for each component that we have to go back and, and reallocate i guess i'm just wondering whether we need to whether going forward this is going to be the practice it seems like it's something we should we should consider well so the best answer i can give you is that i agreed with you that we all we approved is an amount mm -hmm. and that um if there if the work as long as they weren't doing work that was unapproved I wouldn't really have a problem with them spending X on Y versus W on Z. But our mm -hmm. Bureau of Fiscal Management, at least with respect to Whispering Maples, took a different view and said, oh, no, 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 no. The board, we're deeming the board to have approved each of these categories of work at these amounts. Mm -hmm. And if we spend more on category A and less than category B, less than category B is fine, but more on category A requires further action from the board. Now, that was a slightly different situation there we had actually exceeded the original appropriation the original approved amount but the approved amount had in fact been increased by a previous modification of the order which we were then coming in under so that was mm -hmm. wrinkle number one wrinkle number two is we were working with two million dollars there provided by a special uh, by special legislation not directly through the fund and mm -hmm. it's possible that fiscal viewed that money as having been tied to specific categories of work. So okay. it, it may be that this is totally unnecessary, but we're up against the deadline for paying things out of this year's fiscal, um, mm -hmm. you know, this year's appropriation. I want to pay this out of this year's money. I also don't want them to have to sit around and wait until we have oh, access to the next person. Of course, yeah. So um, I'm essentially not having received greater clarification on this, I want to make sure we do get this approval. The final thing I'll say is this is extremely unusual. Mm -hmm. um, the typical application is for much simpler work. I mean, even for abandonment, it's they're paving a road, 
they're cleaning up this, they're taking down trees. This is like a con this is a construction project, a significant mm -hmm. construction project. Same with Whispering Maples. That's not something we typically see, and it's all we also have been paying it like a construction project in progress payments. Mm -hmm. So I think you put those two things together, and I think it would make sense to be more cautious here, and to it's not likely to be have major precedential value because we just don't get that many things that look like this. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll pursue that clarification, but for the moment I will make a motion. Uh, Mark, to... Can I just jump in for a quick second? Um, sure, of course, Tony. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the only th the clarification I want to provide is one thing the board does do is make sure that all the expenditures are for appropriate items. So uh, I, I just want to clarify that a, a, a town on this type application can't, because it's under budget, add things that weren't approved. Because yeah. Some of them may not be appropriate for, but that's not happening here. It's just a reallocation of uh, expenditures that were approved. Uh, yeah, if Lewis can get uh, fiscal uh, to, to agree that we don't need a board orders on this type of alteration, I think that'd be great. Yeah, our deadline for submitting this to fiscal is Friday, so I don't think okay. we're going to get that for this one, but going forward, we certainly can. Okay, so I'm making a motion, and uh, Tony, if you can assist me uh, to modify the previous uh, abandonment application from the town of Ox uh to allocate, reallocate um uh twenty four thousand dollars and twenty four thousand seven hundred twenty dollars and sixty eight cents uh, from previously approved uh categories uh which have exceeded the initial estimates from uh uh, uh expenditures that came in under previous approved um estimates uh for a total of uh staying within the original uh approved application is that sufficient, Tony? I think, Mike, correct me, is the number wrong? Is the amount that's being reallocated to 27,436.49? It, it seems like that's the amount by which the floor and truck are over budget. So that's the amount that's being reallocated. Yes, I, I believe that's correct. Okay. That was the amount. That was the amount that went over, and there's this uh, an ex in excess of that was under. So the reallocation would be the twenty seven thousand. Okay, and that's the only change I have, Mark. Is the amount uh, as as amended or twenty seven? A number I don't uh, see in the uh, in the agenda. So. Um, Somebody should specify the number so that it's clear for the record. Yeah, well, somebody should. 27,000. Yeah. I asked, I asked Mike earlier there. if 24,000 was the correct number, and he said yes. So now Hang he's going to give me the new right number. The amount by which the floor and truck expenditure is over budget is $27,436.49. So that's the reallocation. Yeah. Right, that's on page two of Mike's write up. Yeah, correct. Okay, so my motion is modified to reflect the $27,000 figure as mentioned in this uh, conversation. Do I have a second? Mm -hmm. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Next Before application. Before we move on, uh, Mike, have they finished all of this work? Yes, the work has all been completed. Everything, uh, everything has been purchased. They've they're just waiting for um, payment. So I don't know that that's I don't know that this is really something that's germane for the board. But um, this one is we could pay this one now in full without any retainage because you've inspected the work and verified that it's all done. That, that's a division issue, so I don't think that needs yeah. to be discussed or disclosed. Okay. The okay. next application is from uh, from a Packard Cemetery in Onondaga County. 
uh, in the amount of 43, allegedly in the amount of $43,735. Uh, uh, it is a vandalism application, a division presenting that. Mike, this one's a little complicated. You want to explain the history? Uh, yes. Uh, Firma Packard is a Baker Jewish cemetery in the city of Syracuse. They had applied for um, funds for repair of hazardous monuments. The cemetery is set on a rather steep hillside. Um, and while I was there with the president and another board member of the cemetery, we note we noticed uh, there were several monuments that had been knocked down and appeared to be vandalism. Um, at the time, we looked at the the, uh, the downed monuments that were primarily in the older section of the cemetery and discussed um, making a claim for uh, vandalism repair. However, we looked at the uh, hazardous monuments that we were there to see and determined that the the priority should be to correct these hazardous monuments so someone did not get hurt. So rather than have two uh, monument applications going simultaneously, I suggested to the cemetery president that he wait until we um, complete the hazardous monument application and um, have the repairs done and, and then file a new application for the vandalism. Um, unfortunately, that took a little bit longer than we originally expected. However, uh, they did file their um, uh, application for repair of 116 vandalized monuments. Um, they got two estimates for the repairs. Um, I've seen the monuments uh, two times uh, when we initially discovered that they were down and then again uh, this year uh, when I was reviewing the uh, the repairs to the hazardous monuments. Um, this is a pretty straightforward application. However, uh, the cemetery requested that the uh, requirement for the police report uh, be waived and they have a detailed letter uh, explaining that they feel that um, publicizing the vandalism would be bad for the outlook of the cemetery. Um, I've noted that in the report and um, discussed that with the cemetery president. Um, one thing I'll add is uh, th this is the only non-affiliated Jewish cemetery in Onondaga County. And I think that comes into play because being unaffiliated with the synagogue, they don't have specific records um, that they would have as far as um, uh, decedents and uh, the descendants of the decedents. Um, so the division has recommended uh, approval for $43,735 for this vandalism claim. This is, I'm just going to add, this is a little bit unusual uh, in several respects. And I, I want to focus because I know council raised an issue about the fact that the, about the advertisement. Um, the cemetery should be on, on the call, is on the meeting and should be able to provide additional information. But um, we, generally speaking, um, I, you know, legal notices are not going to be something that's a lightning rod for for negative press. But the flip side of that is, and we'll talk about this more probably when we get to Glenside, it's extremely rare. Glenside actually is one of, is maybe an exception, but it's extremely rare that a cemetery that publishes a legal notice on an application, either for vandalism or hazardous monuments, ever gets any kind of response. I can maybe remember one or two cases in the last seven years where that's happened. Um, on the other hand, in this case, the records that the cemetery has, these are all old burials. The odds of them having any current contact with any of these families are pretty slim. Like Mike said, it's not a synagogue affiliated cemetery, so it's not like the families might still be around. Although frankly, with synagogue affiliated cemeteries, 
when you're two or three generations out, the odds are the synagogue is going to have no way of contacting the family either. So our, our recommendation is still for approval. Um, again, I don't, I don't think that any further attempts of what's the statutory term? Um, losing it now. Um, um, any further, I'll just paraphrase, any further attempts to try to track down people who might conceive, and even, let me add one more thing, is even when people do get tracked down, it's, I can't remember a single case in which a family had, was either willing to provide funds to restore the uh, vandalized stone or had insurance that covered the stone. Lewis, um, I think you've case, neglected to explain why we do that anyway. What's the purpose of uh, looking for um, lot owners? We, oh, we okay. attempt to so get step back. lot owners to pay for the repairs themselves first. Right. I mean, generally, right. Generally speaking, the maintenance of a monument is the lot owner's responsibility, not the cemetery's responsibility. Where we generally want a cemetery to try to find the lot owners and seek in some form or another and seek payment for them in some form or another before we're willing to write a check ourselves. And I, I was looking for the, not finding right now the statutory language, but there is language um, that has, that addresses cemeteries trying to, yeah, the cemetery has to be unable to obtain funds from the lot owner within a reasonable period of time. That's in the statute. Um, for those of you keeping score at home, it's 1507 parentheses H parentheses uh, five uh, parentheses IV. Okay. Is that an, are you finished, Lewis? Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tony, do you have uh, comments on this application? Yeah. Um, so, as far as the timing requirement, um, I think the cemetery is in good shape. The, the hard requirement is notify the division within 30 days of discovery of the vandalism, which they did. Uh, there's a six month requirement of completing an application, but that's can be extended and the division extended that. Um, but the issue of notice is very separate. Uh, the, the statute does permit um, the cemetery on the consent of the division to not file a police report. That's right in the statute. There's nothing that says that the division can consent to not giving or attempting to give notice to the lot owners. Um, as Lewis points out, cemeteries don't own the monuments. They're owned by the lot owners. Um, that's why in each case here, uh, whether it's vandalism or a dangerous monument, there's a requirement that they reach out to the lot owners first before they come to us for these funds. And uh, the regulation says, um, in the event that damage was done to a crypt niche, gravesite, monument, or memorial, the cemetery must provide written notice to the lot owner next to kin if the identity and whereabouts is reasonably ascertainable. It describes what should be in the notice and it should advise the lot owner to seek insurance benefits under their homeowner's policy. And actually, you know, a, a homeowner's policy is more likely to cover an act of vandalism than a, a, a monument that's tipping and dangerous. Um, so, you know, unlike the next application uh, where uh, also a vandalism application where there was an attempt by providing notice uh, uh, by publication, th th this cemetery didn't even provide that. Um, and as far as, you know, I'm, I'm confused by the colloquy about, you know, the cemetery isn't a, uh, affiliated with a, a, a synagogue, therefore it doesn't have good records. I mean, it, it is a cemetery corporation. It's required to have the same records as any of our cemeteries. Um, so that factor is, does not affect its duty as a cemetery corporation to comply with the notice requirements. Um, and they haven't. So just by way of clarification, I, I guess we'll probably talk about this more when we get to Glenn's side. Um, 
I'm on uh, two things is I'm unaware of a situation where we've had a vandalism application where there has been no legal notice published. This would be unusual for this to be approved without a legal notice. On the flip side, I'm unaware of a situation in which we've had where we've actually required cemeteries to do anything other than publish a legal notice. Because in the vast majority of situations uh, where, unless the grave that was vandalized is a very recent burial, the cemetery is not going to have useful contact information for um, the uh, for the family. Um, it's been a very, it's very rare. I can think of a couple of cases where cemeteries were able to find uh, uh, vandal families of, of of headstones that are vandalized. And in any event. Um, I can't think of a single case in which a family was willing to come forward and pay. Now, maybe there was one case where a homeowner's policy covered it in seven years. But other than that, I can't think of a, uh, maybe there was one time where that happened. For what that's worth. So, is there, what's the, what is the recommendation from council? Yeah, I mean, I understand we want to try and get our um, expenditures met uh, before the next fiscal year starts, but um, there is no harm to the cemetery to have them go back and, and get a notice printed. I mean, that's that's what we always do. That's what the reg at a minimum would require. Let me make a suggestion along those lines then. Um, if, uh, I, I mean, I think we ought to hear from the cemetery, but this is vandalism that at this point occurred several years ago. Publishing a legal notice, a legal notice now that this occurred several years ago is I think not gonna draw the same kind of attention to the cemetery that it did, um, that it might have if it were published immediately when it happened. You know, it's been several years, there has not been vandalism at this or any other local cemetery. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, at this point, see the downside to them taking out a legal notice. On the other hand, it's, it's almost unheard of for a legal notice to um, result in any payment actually coming to the cemetery. So what I'd ask the board to consider in this case is approving the application now and conditioning, remember, we don't make full payment on these applications. We retain a portion for a second payment. So we could make, we could approve it now. We could make a first payment. The second payment would be conditioned on receipt, on proof, receipt of proof of publication of a suitable notice. And we can discuss with the cemetery what that notice would include. And to the extent the cemetery, in the extraordinarily unlikely event that the cemetery receives any funds as a result of identifying any owners as a result of that notice, we can deduct them from the uh, the second payment. In the and I, I think there's there isn't even any conceivable scenario in which the cemetery could recover enough money that it would be more than a second payment. I just that, that would be beyond the realm of anything I, I could comprehend. Um, so the, the concern about the, 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 the fiscal year payments is we've had problems in the last couple of years where we started a fiscal year in the hole with previous year's submission. And ideally we'd like to avoid that. So given the extreme unlikelihood that this, I'm not saying we shouldn't do this process, but given the extreme unlikelihood that this process is gonna result in any recovery by the cemetery, I'd ask that we approve it now, conditioned on them publishing an ad and getting um, uh, a, uh, and, and not getting a second payment until we've gotten proof of publication. Is the cemetery on the line or available? Uh, or Hello, this is, this, is, this is Andy Dvorsitz. I'm the president of Prima Packard. Uh, feel free to to uh, to comment on what you've heard so far or the your application. 
Uh, I, uh, you know, I appreciate, you know, your, your time and consideration. And, uh, I, I think that, you know, if, you know, the money means a lot to us, uh, and we need it and we'd like to go forward and, and, um, you know, I would, uh, uh, certainly, um, you know, we would certainly agree to, uh, publicizing, although we didn't want to, um, I understand your points and, uh, you know, well taken and, uh, there's a, uh, procedure to follow and I will certainly uh, uh, be agreeable to uh, um, publicizing um, publicizing it uh, and, you know and uh, you know in, in order to and uh, in, in sending it to you along the way so okay uh, again uh, Tony any comments Um, no, I, I mean, I, I think I've laid out the issues for the board. It, it's up to the board on how to come to a decision on, on this one. Okay. Uh, I personally think the suggestion, uh, is, um, reasonable, meaning that we, uh, uh, approve the, the application contingent, uh, on the cemetery issuing a notice um, as per required and that we would withhold uh, the second payment um, uh, until we did got a receipt got re received the, the uh, assurances that the uh, publication was received and any information about uh, monies uh, that uh, might offset the total uh, price is I think that's clear um, uh, do I have a second? Um, I, I, can I just, um, just ask a question? How long would the, the process of publication take? I mean, if, if the cemetery were to undertake to do that now um, and then, you know, show us proof that that was done, how, how long, how, how much does that delay moving forward? Uh, a couple of weeks, but it puts us into the next fiscal year. Okay. okay. But um, I would say, I mean, in the normal course of things, that process will be done well before we'd be prepared to make a second payment anyway, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. to do the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. I think the board's comfort level has to be with the proposal as, as meeting the requirements and securing the, the problems as Tony's outlined. The issue of fiscal year is secondary, although you know it's obviously important to uh, the division and and the agency. But uh, you know, unless the board was comfortable with that, then I don't think that that would be a good idea. I am comfortable with it, thinking that it it, it solves the problem without, uh, but it still maintains uh, us requiring what is required. So, but that's I think that's the discussion. I, I don't yeah. I want to make sure. We don't let the fiscal year issue drive the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, unduly drive the right. Is there any reason why it couldn't be approved um, subject to the publication requirement and um, th the funds be dispensed once you know the uh, approving the funds once we get confirmation um, that the publication has been made? Other than the fact that that will put it into the next fiscal year, no. Even if the even if the the approval, in other words, it's it's that that's that's not that's not possible because it's not when the, the approval is made; it's when it's when the funds are are released. My understanding is the check has to the the paperwork has to be up to fit our fiscal people by Friday so they can cut the check next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't physically cut checks, but yeah. The equivalent. You're, you're trying to get them the whole payment, uh, which I don't think we would do anyway. I no, we would count. So, right? No, they wouldn't. They don't. They would never under regard if they had published an ad listing all of the individuals mm -hmm. and what have you, and there was definitely no issue. They still wouldn't get full payment right now because right. we withhold a portion of the payment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Until the works until the work is done, right? The work's not done. 
uh, sorry, until the work is done and we've inspected it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, you know, it, in considering this, I, I, I do think it's difficult to get around the fact that there's a statutory requirement that wasn't that wasn't met, and I, I understand the urgency because of the fiscal year, but, um, you know, as, as Mark said, if that weren't a consideration, and we knew that it was a, you know, a two week process, and then they could, um, you know, generate confirmation of compliance, I would say, you know, let's do that. Is there, is there anything else, um, you know, Tony or, or Lewis that we could consider doing that would, you know, be mindful of the time consideration, but also satisfy the board that the requirements are met? I mean, we, we, I suppose we could have an agreement with them mm -hmm. for some kind of recruitment if they don't publish by a certain date. Mm -hmm. Of the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the reg requires them to return any unexpended monies. Mm -hmm. It, that usually is because they've saved money, not because in the end they weren't able to come through on the mm -hmm. application requirements. Um, but I suppose. Well, we're advancing the money now. They're not going to do the work, uh, right? right? It, it's grounds frozen. So, I mean, you could make a contingent on receipt uh, approved, contingent on receipt of the, the uh, Notice, and they're not going to do, you know, they're not going to do the work until until uh, they would get. We're advancing the money, so they would they get the money, but they, and we could count it, but they wouldn't mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. do the work. Well, there's a thought. There's yeah, a thought. I'd, be comfortable, spend, I'd be comfortable. I'd be comfortable with that. I don't see why that's a problem for the cemetery. I mean, I mean, because they can still contract and you know go forward and make preparations, but. Um, but if the funds are not, you know, I, I, I would feel comfortable if um, there was an agreement that we would, before the funds were spent, we would receive that confirmation. Okay. So, so then the motion would be, here, Mark, you want to try to formulate it? That to approve the application from Broward uh, Packard uh, in the amount of 43,735 hours uh, contingent on receiving uh, re receipt of the proper notice to lot owners. I mean, it, it, with the understanding that uh, they won't spend the funds until we receive the, um, we, we're, we, we've given the notification, right? right? I think it's important to clarify that the notice is noticed by publication in this mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. Notice by publication. Right. And we can, We'll probably talk about this more when we get to Glenn's side, but well, we'll approve your motion first, and then I'll. Well, I, don't, I don't have a second yet. I will yeah. second. Any other discussion, just either on curing the motion or, or uh, facts need to be discussed. Okay, so uh, all in favor. Aye. 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 Uh, Motion to Fruman is Frumat, sorry, is approved with conditions subject to uh, fund availability. Thank you for helping us work through that. Uh, Glenside Cemetery uh, in the amount of fifteen thousand three hundred and sixty-six dollars and eighty cents in Wayne County. Uh, um, Mike, you want to start? Yep, uh, this is Mike Seelman. Uh, Glenside Cemetery is a uh, Four acre cemetery in Wayne County uh, in the village of Wolcott. Uh, they were vandalized in August of 2020. There were 65 monuments that were uh, toppled. Um, they did receive a police report. The police uh, do not have any leads. Um, and no arrests were made. Uh, they think that it, it was, there were kids congregating in the cemetery uh, in kind of a, a secluded area. They think that likely led to this. 
Uh, since then, the cemetery has made some changes to, to, to keep loiterers out of the cemetery. Uh, they have their two uh, estimates. Uh, we recommend approval uh, the amount of uh, $15,366.80. Um, again, this cemetery posted uh, a legal notice to try to uh, contact lot owners. Um, however, the format of that legal notice wasn't exactly what we were looking for for a, a vandalism uh, legal notice. Uh, Michael, you broke up a little bit, but uh, I think the gist of that was that the division is recommending the project. Tony, do you have comments? Yeah, just, so let me just clarify a little bit. So the legal, no, the main thing the notice didn't have is it didn't list the names of the, the, the lot, the graves vandalized, and it didn't list the locations. Um, in this case, the cemetery actually got two responses from families who was, whose plots were the subject of the vandalism, both of whom said, we don't have any money to pay for this. So in this, so take a step back, as we read it, the statute and the regulations don't specifically say you have to list the names of the lot owners. We, as a matter of course, expect to see that um, because there was vandalism at X Cemetery isn't nearly as useful as there was vandalism at X Cemetery and Smith and Jones's plots were damaged. Um, but in this case, in this particular case, it seems to us that the lot owners did get noticed by virtue of the fact that people actually came forward. Council. Yeah, um, I mean, we've been down this road with division before. Um, there were times that cemeteries were very inconsistent with their legal notices. Some would publish the names without the lot numbers, some would pu publish the lot numbers without the names. Um, and so uh, we worked through that and division very consistently has been requiring the cemeteries, has let the cemeteries know they gotta have both in their um, legal notices. Um, this one <clears throat> didn't have either. It just said, you know, uh, I'm looking at it now, um, 70 monuments or markers located in the south, midwest, and north mis midwest of the cemetery were damaged by vandals. And then for some reason it says, so as to create a dangerous condition, which makes it look like this is a, uh, a dangerous monument application when it's a vandalism application. Um, so, I would suggest that the process we just went through on the prior application uh, would be an appropriate one here, have them republish uh, with the same conditions, so, you know, this time listing all the, the lots and, and uh, lot owners. And that would cure this issue. Any other comments or questions for me, the division or board members? I don't know if the cemetery is on the call. Um, oh, cemetery on the call? Yes, hello, my name is Joan. Hello, Joan. Thank you for Hi. Do you have something to uh, add to this conversation about, uh, about the notice and uh, the suggestion that we would approve this but require you to uh, repost or republish, I guess, uh, a notice uh, and then submit proof of that reposting to us uh, before you expended the funds. That would be fine. I, I've already paid out over $90. It probably have to pay out a little bit more. That's okay. Okay. Uh, so just, just to clarify. Um, we would not, in this case, we would not recommend increasing the, I mean, normally the legal notice is something that the cemetery recovers as part of the application. 
we're not prepared to recommend that the cost of a second legal notice be paid by the state. Uh, okay. The first one really wasn't, should be also, I paid for that myself. And I'll pay for this one myself. We don't have the money for doing this, you know, kind of thing. In general, the second, your first notice. Yes. Could be the cost of the, the notice can be part of the application. But that will go to the cemetery. It's not supposed to go to me. Correct. Correct. <laughs> so, so I'll be, I'll be doing it twice. That's okay. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. No. We can, I have no choice. We can provide technical assistance on that. It's, I don't know if it's possible for the cemetery to reimburse you or not. So, but I'll make a motion and, and, and thank you, Joan. Uh, just not, I don't mean to be informal. That's uh, just use your name, Joan. Thank you no, for not okay. only being on the phone call and giving us uh, information about your work to support the cemetery. We do appreciate that. And we understand thank you. that it's, it's a labor of love for many, many people. So. Okay, so I'm going to make a motion to approve the application uh, of Glenside Cemetery. Is the amount fifteen thousand three sixty-six? There's a number fifty-nine thousand underneath that. I don't know what that is, but that's uh, uh, a subtotal. So fifteen thousand three hundred sixty-six dollars eighty cents, uh, with the understanding that the cemetery will republish uh, a notice as prescribed by the division. Uh, and provide that uh, proof of that republishing and its and a response before the funds are expended. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Uh, any uh, other? Go ahead. And we will get um, a format that I can follow, please, because I don't. Okay. We will work with you to make sure you've got the proper. Proper uh, notice. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, we that concludes the availability app applications. Thank you very much. We have two other uh, applications before us. Um, uh, what, the first is a Riverhurst Cemetery. Uh, it's a columbarium application. I don't know where Riverhurst. Is but can the division present Binghamton. that? Binghamton, thank you. Yeah, Brendan? this is uh, this is Brendan Stanton with the division of cemeteries, uh, the Riverhurst uh, Cemetery of the Town of Union, uh, Broome County, uh, which is where I live. Incidentally, um, has applied for the installation of a 96 niche columbarium unit. Um, they recently. Uh, within the past three years, I believe it was approved in 2018 and installed in 2019, uh, put in a, a another columbarium unit. Um, this area is earmarked for five total columbarium units. Uh, this is unit number two of the five. Um, the first one is, has been selling well. Um, they have, uh, you know, interest already in this uh, next unit, um, the foundation was already poured as part of the first uh, installation. Um, they also have uh, the pathways and everything else is already there. Um, uh, they posted the, the notice as required. There was a little bit of a wrinkle. Um, but a sufficient amount of time has passed uh, as of the 5th um, from the time that it was posted and stayed posted. Um, so on that basis, uh, I recommend approval of uh, the installation of this columbarium unit. And they're paying for this out of their general fund? That is correct. Okay. Um, any other issues uh, with the application at uh, council? Do you have any questions about the Riverhurst application? Yeah, um, my questions are generally about um, the cemetery, not so much about the application. Um, they seem to be struggling to um, come up with a surplus. Each year they, they, they've, they've had deficits. And Brendan has indicated in his report that um, 
their costs seem high. Um, well, so one of my questions is that they, they report rental income. Do we know what that rental income is, the source of that? Yeah, they've purchased a few houses on the adjacent streets. Um, and and uh, I guess with the, with the intent, if they need to expand the cemetery, they can do so. But at this time, they rent those out for, uh, there's houses on them and they rent them out for income. Do we know if uh, they came to the board for approval to purchase that land? They did come for approval to purchase the land uh, back when these were purchased. Okay. And then the, the next question I have, um, well, you know, one of the things I, I notice is their, um, their wage expenses all over the place uh, from a low within the four years that are reported of 85,000 to a high of 145,000. Is there any, do we know why? It's such, um, it varies so much. Uh, this is Andrew Hickey, uh, senior accountant. My thought on the wages, Tony, is, and uh, Riverhurst may be on the call, but they've, they're have they transitioning from one type of management style to a different. Um, I, I think, in general, the wages will be going down. I think there could have been some uh, separation payments in there, but it's the trustees current assertion that the management costs will be material lower 2020 and going forward and then my last question uh, is um you know sometimes when we see a cemetery with unusually high expenses there's related party transactions going on whether it's you know accounting legal um you know they're they're using somebody a related party to do the mowing the digging we know if that's an issue here, if there are any related party transactions going on that might have resulted in inflated costs. Uh, again, this is Andrew Hickey, senior accountant. Uh, at this point, we're not aware of any related party transactions that's that's driving that. I think they have been working on reducing those costs, Tony, and it's it's their assertion right now that their labor costs are going to decrease. Uh, but they they have verbalized that it's a very labor intensive cemetery to mow, a lot of leaves, a lot of mowing, a lot of headstones. And I think that's one reason why they're tackling or taking on the columbarium is they think it's a uh, cost effective way to memorialize uh, more so than traditional burials, which do require a lot of labor. And secondly, I think that they are working on trying to reduce their administrative management costs. And I think that they have done that. Uh, the 2020 report is not in yet, but I think we will see uh, a material decrease in uh, management and labor costs. So the only comment I have with regard to the application itself is that um, since this is their second columbarium, they have a track record which supports the estimates, you know, the trouble we have is when it's a cemetery's first columbarium and we don't have a track record, but here we do. And I, I think uh, the application uh, meets the requirements. Okay. Uh, so uh, any other questions uh, on this application? Uh, River Hurst, if you are on the line, you can, are welcome to speak if you want to. I'll take that as no, or the another line. So I'll make a motion to approve the application from Riverhurst Cemetery in Broome County for the addition of a column bearing. Uh, I don't have the number in front of me, a price number, but uh, uh, I don't think that's terribly relevant. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. We have an application from Pine Lawn Cemetery. For major alteration fuel tank replacement division. Yep, that's me. Um, so what's going on here is Pine Lawn's got a maintenance area. It's kind of smack in the middle of the eastern section of the cemetery. Um, it's in an area that's fenced off and uh, not really visible from the road. They've got their garage there and a whole bunch of other things, dirt pile, what have you. Um, 
they uh, – sure, I should say one of their garages. I'm pretty sure they have multiple garages. Um, but they have an in-ground tank, uh, which my understanding is before my time, we were encouraging all cemeteries to get them out of the ground. Um, generally a good idea because you don't want in-ground tanks leaking. So they're doing that. They've gotten in uh, – They've got from working with them on it. They've got now their uh, local permits. Apparently, it's uh, the DEC sets the standards, but the local, but Suffolk County and the town are actually the permitting authorities here, and they're prepared to take it out. They're going to be putting in above ground tanks instead. And um, this is going to again. There's no burials anywhere near there, and it's treed off and fenced off from from the rest of the cemetery. Obviously, we think it's a good idea to undertake a project that improves the environment, so we're recommending approval. Uh, the whole thing's coming out of general fund, which the cemetery has ample general funds to cover the cost and without noticing that they've even spent the check. Uh, okay. Council? Yeah. Um, the only thing I note here is it looks like the contractor um, has a duty after removing the underground tank, uh, a duty required by uh, DEC to test to make sure there were no spills. Uh, I recommend that uh, we require the cemetery to provide vision with the results of those tests so we we can be sure that there were no spills uh, during this process. Other than that, I have no, no comment on the project. Anybody else have questions? Anybody from Pine Lawn um, interested in commenting additional information? This is David Fleming uh, representing Pine Lawn. I think the application um, is fairly extensive. It's a pretty standard project and uh, follows DEC guidelines. Something obviously that the cemetery would like to move forward with as quickly as possible. Uh, the sooner they can get the tank out of the ground, the better. Okay. Okay. Uh, no other questions. Uh, uh, well, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, panel on, uh, application for major alteration for a fuel uh, tank replacement. And uh, note that we uh, would like to see the uh, report or the assurances that the contractor uh, complied with the DEC requirements for uh, a report after the tank is removed for spills. Do I have a second? I'll second. Tom, thank you. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, that completes our normal business. Um, uh, we are at the public comment period. Uh, does anyone from the public like wish to address the board on this, these, or any other uh, issues? Mr. Chairman, it's Dave Fleming from the New York State Association of Cemeteries. Um, David? Oh. I'll, I'll butt in before you go to the next meeting date, but I wanted to say that um, on the uh, composting legislation that was talked about, a NISAC has been involved in the discussions on that uh, bill. Um, it's not a uh, piece of legislation that came from NISAC, but we have been involved in discussions with the sponsor. And uh, as a couple of folks pointed out, it is a just a composting bill. So it is kind of following the Washington state um, model where there are essentially these pods. Um, the one uh, important thing for the board to note is that the legislation only allows this composting process to happen at a regulated uh, not-for-profit cemetery in New York. So um, that's, uh, I think, an important point uh, that we still follow all the same processes that you would follow um, for some sort of disposition process in New York. And um, those same kinds of protections are also included um, and as far as the resale of graves uh, questions that Mr. Polishuk was discussing, and he's getting a lot of calls, I'm getting a lot of calls too um, at the association. So we're going to uh, we're going to 
uh, republish uh, on our website, social media as, um, as well, and send out a broadcast email to our members. On uh, We have an article that was published about a year ago in our magazine that kind of outlines the process and, and shows how it's been streamlined by the board and the division. So we'll uh, be sure to share that. Hopefully that'll alleviate some of those uh, questions to the division. That's all I had and thank you very much. Thank you, David. Any other members of the public or uh, from our member cemeteries wishing to address the board? If not, the next meeting would be uh, uh, April, tell me what, Lewis? Uh, what's the next meeting, Lewis? April? I was muted April 13th. April 13th at 10.30. Uh, we have no... Obviously, if, if there's a reason for all the Ulster County matter that we need to meet sooner, we'll get in touch with everybody. Okay. Uh, we have no need to go to executive session, so I think we've concluded our business. Again, I, as always, I appreciate the time and energies our staff and member uh, cemeteries put in trying to make sure our the business is done. Uh, can, I, can I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, meeting before the board members much. quit off of the call, before the board members quit off the call, uh, we're going to be sending out uh, board orders to be signed for the uh, vandalism fund applications. It's absolutely critical you get those back to us immediately because we've got to walk them upstairs today or tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. Okay. Thanks a lot.